Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad that you have come, and I would like to talk to you a bit about uh, learning morphology from the corpus. So uh, the first thing is, uh, why should we do it? Um, morphology is really important for many, I would say most, NLP tasks, be it parsing, structural machine translation, e even phrase-based machine translation can use morphology in some way. Then uh, corpus annotation and uh, <coughs> corpus linguistics, so corpus queries and such things use morphology. Then uh, it's maybe even used in uh, user inf interfaces of some applications or in spoken dialogue systems. And <coughs> the quality of uh, the morphology module will influence uh, the overall quality of uh, that particular application. So that's the motivation in general. That, and now my personal motivation, and that would be avoiding the unknown word tag in Czech as much as possible. Because uh, in the applications I've been working with in the recent months, there are many unknown words uh, <coughs> that are not in our UFAL Czech dictionary, so I was getting the unknown word tag very often. So that led me to <coughs> experiment with, with learning the morphology from the data. Uh, I can name just a few examples. Uh, in the Crashmoy project, uh, which concentrates on translation of medical texts, there are many medical terms. You can see arthroplastica, I don't know, many more that are not recognized by our UFAL morphological dictionary. And uh, we have a statistical dialogue system with Filip Jurčiček uh, that should give public transport directions to people. And there we have uh, names of uh, public transport stops that are also not recognized by the dictionary. There is an example, Dolnokačská, but there are many more. So th that can make up to 5% of words that are not recognized by our UFAL dictionary. So, and uh, the other thing is uh, I've been using the morphology in tricks and I don't know if there is a guesser there. I, I don't know of any. <coughs> and uh, the other motivation is uh, that I would like to inflect anything. So even if uh, the words are somehow guessed by the morphological analysis, I would like to use them. For example, in the, that dialogue system, I would like to inflect any name of any stop to direct the user to that stop. So these were my motivations. And uh, I also thought that it is quite reasonable to try to do it. Because uh, as you probably know, morphology in many languages is mostly very regular. Only the number and shape of the inflection patterns differ, but there are certain patterns that repeat quite regularly. This is a picture I found on the internet that shows it quite nicely for English. <coughs> it, it works as simple as, as math. You just cross out some, some letters and the result comes out. And I <coughs> wanted to make it work like this also for Czech and possibly other languages. So the possible approaches to solving morphology are these. So the first one is using a dictionary, which works very well, is really reliable. But uh, sometimes you run out the, of the coverage of the dictionary. Or for some languages, there is no large coverage dictionary available or is not freely available. Then uh, we can use some handwritten rules, but uh, they start to get really difficult to maintain once you have a, <coughs> a language with a more complex morphology, such as Czech. Or we can try to learn it from the data. There we can try to obtain the rules somehow automatically, and we have plenty of training data of sufficient size available. For example, the Hamlet, 
corpus uh, has got about 33 banks for 30 languages and I think that most of them are uh, contain some morphological annotations and are <coughs> of a sufficient size so that's why I'm trying to do it and now how this talk is going to be structured it's in chronological order of my own experiments so it's not the logical order so I will start with generation so uh, this is mainly the work I've done with Filip Jurčiček uh, for our paper at uh, the ACL student research workshop and it's mostly about the tool which we've called FLECT which is a statistical morphology generator after the talk about generation we will proceed back to the analysis and these are my recent and not exactly finished experiments on Czech and I've been trying to create a very simple morphology module to go with a Futurama tagger and compare it to the <coughs> morphological dictionary of Professor Hayic which we have here <coughs> and also with the new tagger that Milan Straka is now working on. So that would be analysis and then I would hope to have a discussion with you about uh, if this is really usable or if we should do it and what would the applications of it be or how could we improve the results. So let's start with the morphology generation. So <coughs> we have a morphology generator that uses machine learning to predict the inflection forms and uh, I only know about one statistical morphology generator module that's been done before. This is this work and we've tried it uh, on six languages from the Connell 2009 data set where we have a varying degree of morphological richness so we have English and Japanese that do not have very complex morphology but on the other hand we also have uh, German and Czech with very complex morphology so let's see <coughs> uh, in uh, the natural language generation for English uh, you mostly do not need to generate morphology or <coughs> concern yourself with morphology if you're doing uh, natural language generation system because you can hard code some rules and it often works well enough but uh, for other languages such as Czech even the, the simplest application this is simple uh, template filling applications uh, have trouble with morphology this is from Facebook you can see that Toto se líbí uživateli Jana Nováková is yeah, it's, it's understandable, but it's not very fluent because uh, the word user must be in a, in a dative case and it's kind of standing in for the inflection of the name itself. The same is, is with Doodle because uh, here you should have a vocative case uh, addressing the user, but uh, it addresses the user in, in nominative, which also doesn't feel very fluent so it's <coughs> it's uh, very plausible that this could help the, the performance of even such simple applications so our task is uh, given a word and some morphological inflection information we should generate the, the target word form. So here you have the, the base form word, there you have the morphological tag that says that it should be in plural and the result is words. The same is for German, there you also have uh, not only plural but also the neuter gender and dative case and the result is the <coughs> target form Wörtern and yeah the same goes with verbs and it also in much more languages 
the, the features look different, but uh, the <coughs> main principle is the same. It's actually an inverse task to part of speech tagging. So, how do we do it? We <coughs> change the, the learning to the inflection patterns as a simple supervised multi-class classification machine learning task. So, from the training data, we can extract the forms and, and the base forms and see what's the difference. Uh, this is based on a Levenstein distance. Uh, we generate a kind of edit script that encodes the change. This, is, uh, this says that at the end you should delete one letter and add this, <coughs> this ending. So this produces from the base form fly, it produces the, the target form flies. And there are <coughs> more variants. You can even have some changes at the beginning. So <coughs> you can add more characters to the beginning of words. You can change words in the middle in some cases, but uh, uh, the distance uh, in the middle is counted from the end because uh, we think that uh, the words mostly change at the end and uh, if you have some prefixes, it it's usually doesn't have much influence on the morphology, so it's counted from the end. And some words are completely irregular, so they are just replaced. So that's, that's uh, what we target on, how we classify. <coughs> and now what features we should use. Obviously we use the lemma and the part of speech tag and any morphology information that is available, but uh, we <coughs> also use suffixes of the words because uh, we think that uh, this sh should help us to generalize to inputs unseen in the training data and uh, hope that the machine learning is able to deal with some counter examples. And also we lowercase everything because uh, capitalization doesn't have mostly any influence on the morphology. So. The system works like this. You have the base form and the morphological <coughs> features. You add the suffixes and possibly some combinations and in some languages we need to add some information from the context. And then you have a simple machine learning classifier to predict the ch inflectional change or the edit script. We use logistic regression which works well enough and is relatively simple. And then we have some piece of code that takes the base form and the inflectional change and generates the target word form. So that's how the system works. And <clears throat> now to the results. So as I said, we've uh, evaluated it on the Connell 2009 data set on six languages, and these are the results. I should know that this is 90%, so it really works very well for most of the languages. For Czech is about 99.5% accuracy in generating the, the target word form. For English and Japanese is also really well because these are not uh, very morphologically rich. And uh, yeah, for the other languages it doesn't work as well as, as for Czech, English and Japanese, mainly because their uh, morphological text sets are not that detailed as, as the Czech one and they are morphologically richer. So it, it works even on unseen forms. You can see those uh, red bars that are mostly also quite high. Uh, but there are some errors. For example, if you have a verb to torpedo someone, it learns that if you have do and this past tense tag, then the result should be done, so you get torpedo. And for German, uh, the 
lower result is mostly due to syntax sensitive morphology because uh, for example if you have a definite article then a load of words and then adjective uh, and, and the, the, the base noun or the, the main noun then the inflection of the adjective depends on, on the article and there may be a very large gap between the, the article and the adjective. So if we had features that would capture this, uh, for example, in the morphological text set, I would expect that the result would be better. So these are the results for the different languages. And then we also uh, did a comparison with a dictionary that is learned from the same data. It's, it's just learn, just a dictionary that uh, does not generalize to, to unseen forms. It just remembers the forms seen in the training data and uses them or uses the base form if, if, if it doesn't have any, anything else. So for English, such a dictionary that would just remember those forms will perform relatively well I think it's it's above 98% uh, performance. So this is 99.57 or something like this. So our system works better, but not by such a large margin. But uh, there's a very different situation for Czech, where <coughs> if you just memorize the forms from the training data, you reach just about 92% accuracy and on the unseen forms the accuracy is very low about 30% and I would also like to add the comparison uh, with uh, professor's high age generator that is implemented in the Tweaks NLP <coughs> toolkit so this is it's, it's much better than just memorizing the forms from the training data but uh, our system can do even better than this. So that would be the results of uh, the morphological generator. And to sum it up, so we think that the inflection patterns can be learned and that suffixes of words are very useful at that. And yeah, detailed morphological text set and some features from the context also help to make the prediction better. Our system was able to improve on just dictionary memorizing the forms on the same training data and <coughs> is more usable for morphologically rich languages such as Czech. And uh, I think that uh, the Maybe the, the most useful way of using it is, is combining it with uh, the dictionary we have here. So we can use the dictionary, and when the word is not in the dictionary, we can use our system to predict at least some form, which is not <coughs> completely reliable, but still better than just using the base form and not inflecting it at all. So that would be to the morphological generation. And now to some experiments with morphological analysis or tagging. I would just remind you that the task of finding the right lemma or the base form and the part of speech tag is usually divided into two steps, which is just morphological analysis, which is finding all possible part of speech tag for the given word form and the, the lemmas to go with that. And the tagging itself, which selects the, <coughs> uh, the one correct part of speech tag and lemma according to the context, which we haven't uh, in the slide, but you can imagine it is there. Uh, in some cases, lemmas are predicted separately from part of speech tags, but uh, that's not the case here. So, uh, yeah, and one side note, uh, that's a difference to the morphological dictionary we have here. Uh, check lemmas in this dictionary usually have uh, things like uh, some additional information. Some of them are numbered, some of them are, 
are capitalized. So we uh, <coughs> simplify this task just to stripping any additional information because we couldn't infer it from the context, from the data, then <coughs> making everything case insensitive. So this, I think that this uh, will enable us to, to learn lemmas from, from the data or to learn the, the tagging tasks from, from the data and we can still generate other forms using such lemmas. <coughs> so it's still usable, but it's easier than, than having these suffixes. So how, how we can do it? We can use the same ideas as in the generation. We can <coughs> also use the same or very similar edit scripts that are now reverse, so they transform the word form from uh, the, the target word form to, to the lemma. So here you strip four characters and add the base ending and strip at, at the beginning the, the, <coughs> the prefix of, of the superlative form. So it's, it's really very similar to, to the task of generation. And also it's not really new because uh, even uh, the morphological analysis and tagger of Professor Hayich has a statistical guesser that uh, works, I think, very similarly for the forms that are not found in the dictionary. And there also exists uh, a complete <coughs> statistical system that uh, predicts uh, the target part of speech tag and lemma, so a tagger that is able to learn just from the training data and doesn't need any additional dictionary. So <coughs> these are my experiments that I've <coughs> decided to do with this, e even if, if I knew about these works. And that is, uh, let's do only the analysis and leave the hard work, the deciding between the possible part of speech tags and, and lemmas to the tiger. And let's do it for all words so that we don't need any dictionary. And the simplest solution is just to memorize suffixes up to a certain length. For example, the three last uh, letters in a word and the appropriate tags and lemma edit scripts. For example, that could be the word podnebi, which is the same as, as, as this, this suffix. So there's no change in, in, in the lemma and it could have these tags. But it also could uh, belong to the verb velebit and there you need to have <coughs> To, to delete the last character and uh, add the le lemma suffix, and there uh, you have those <coughs> those uh, part of speech tags to go with it. It also could belong to the adverb zapotřebí, which is in the space form. So this is just an example that's much larger hash table of. Uh, suffixes of word forms and the part of speech tags and lemmas to go with this. I think that this works quite similarly to Professor Heich's guesser, but uh, it's only done on all forms and there are some small improvements like smoothing to shorter suffixes or remembering irregular words as a whole. It also can have some parameters. You can increase or decrease the length of the suffixes or uh, have a threshold for minimum occurrence count to add some pattern in, in, into the hash. So those <coughs> are the possibilities to, to adapt the system. And now to some experiments or to results of my experiments. I've uh, as the first step, I have evaluated the coverage of uh, the morphological analysis. So <clears throat> I've 
used the PDT 2.5 development test set and tried to cover it first using Professor Hayek's uh, dictionary with and without Kessler in two different versions. You can see that uh, the version from 2006 is better than the version from last month because uh, it's closer to the original annotation of, of the PDT and now the dictionary is, is slowly drifting away from it. You can see that using Gesser helps really <coughs> quite a lot in, <coughs> in, in both cases. And you can see that it suggests really just a few forms on average for, for each word. So on average, it's such as just few, uh, just four possibilities for, for each word form. Then we can see that my system is uh, really much more dumb because uh, it has comparable coverage. When you use just length three suffixes, it, it's really large coverage, uh, covers most of the things and is comparable to the, the best version of Professor Hyde's system, but it, uh, it gives many more uh, irrelevant uh, options. So on average, this would give, for each word form, it would give 11 possibilities of part of speech tag and lemma. So the coverage is quite okay, but you have a lot of irrelevant suggestions by the, this morphological analysis. And I've taken the morphological analysis trained like this just by memorizing the suffixes and compare it to <clears throat> and uh, use it to train the Futurama tagger and compare it with uh, Futurama tagger using Professor Hayek's dictionary and also uh, the new tagger of Milan Straka which is now in beta version but he he gave it to me to test this, and also I've compared it to the, the Morphet system, which uh, learns everything from the data. So you can see that the result is, uh, I think, yeah, much worse compared to the using the morphological dictionary of Professor Hayek and then the Futurama tagger, or or using Milan Straka's tagger. But still, it's it's not that bad. It's uh, probably better than having nothing at all. So it's not very usable when we already have such a large coverage dictionary that is so reliable. But for a language where we wouldn't have any dictionary at all available, it would be a viable option. You can see that it's 1.5% lower than the best result of Futurama. Yeah, the, the last version didn't finish training, so I couldn't add the numbers here. And you can see that the more fat system is much worse than this, <coughs> this way of training, e even though this is not completely fair because uh, I was able to train the Morphet only on part of the training data because otherwise it would just crash. So these are the results and I would say, uh, say that for Czech using Professor Hayek's analysis with Kessler and the Futurama tagger or any tagger is, is the best option, but we must not forget about the Kessler. And <coughs> for other languages, I think it's quite, it's a possible option to use just something like this to memorize suffixes and use a good tagger to, to predict the best options from those suggestions. So that would be all I would, that I would like to say to you. I think it was really fast, so I'm sorry not to take up the whole hour and uh, yeah, I would really welcome some comments and suggestions on these things. So, thank you.
question and a comment. Uh, uh, could you please tell me, does it happen that uh, the suffix, which is uh, the suffix change rule, which is chosen by the classifier, does not comply with the actual words? I mean, it says that uh, A should be replaced by B and uh, well, I, I, I kind of got rid of this possibility because I, I just uh, tell it to um, the position. So. Uh, so here you, you, you just strip the last four letters of the words and it doesn't matter what letters that were. Okay, but it still could happen that the word is shorter. Yeah, that well, could. My question was more general, whether it yeah. does happen that uh, there is some incompatibility with, between these two. Uh, it could happen that there is an incompatibility, but I have no way of handling this. I think that uh, if it should uh, replace a letter that is, um, I don't know, farther from the end that, than, than the beginning of the word, and it would just add something at the beginning of the word. But uh, I think it, it wouldn't ha really happen that often because it's able to learn that those short, short words are usually very, very frequent, and so the classifier is able to learn that they are inflected somehow differently. Okay, so no space for improvement in this place. <laughs> and uh, as for German, you said that uh, the tags are too coarse. Yeah. I, I think that if you use the tiger data, at least some beginning sections, they have much more detailed uh, morphology, including the cases, uh, even for uh, all uh, I think that the yeah, the, not... the Connell 2009 data set uses the, the Tiger data. But I, I think Zayek might be right that the tag set for the morphological forms is different. Yeah. Actually, the same data. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. Yeah, I think it is, diff it is different from Connell 2007 or something because there is the rich morphology there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So nine is better. So the 2009 thing has a full morphology. I don't know if it's full, but it's definitely richer than the previous version. Okay, so thank you. I, I will look at it and try to <coughs> see if it helps. Uh, did I get it right that, that you uh, wrote uh, the, the edit rules yourself? So, so uh, I mean well, by hand. Or you you mean that uh, I, I would uh, the edit scripts write the edit scripts for for six languages by hand? No, <laughs> so, that so would be really too much work. Uh, we have, for example, for English there is about two hundred edit scripts. For German it's about fifteen hundred. So that would be. So th they were there before. Uh, no, no, no. I've uh, created a script that uses uh, the Levenstein distance and takes the base form, the dilemma, and, and the target word form mm -hmm. and infers the edit script from this. So it's, it's just a bunch of rules to, to create the edit script. Uh, just one short question. You uh, measured coverage, but it's actually a recall, I, or actually, uh, yeah. there can be two kinds of error. Either there is no analysis given for a given word, uh, okay. or there are some, yeah, that's but true. not the correct one. So both of these are counted as errors. Uh, yeah, both of these are counted uh, as errors. Someone would call it coverage, but, you, you know. Well, okay. th there is always at least the unknown word tag predicted, oh. so. <laughs> and, uh, Another question. So, uh, in the generation, it's uh, machine learning based. Yeah. You trained a classifier, yeah. uh, but for the analysis, it's just simple memorizing. Yeah, it's it's much suffixes. simpler. Uh, yeah, because no I thought logistic that, regression. Yeah. No classifier. Because I thought that uh, there's the tagger that should select the best variant in any case. So I would just make the work a bit harder for the tagger and a bit easier for myself. Yes, yes. <clears throat> and my final question... Um, uh, I would just, uh, as a side note, this um, Morphet system uses classifiers to uh, generate probability distributions of uh, tags and lemmas and then some kind of tagger or a global inference above this or on top of this. So that would be may maybe more 
like the, the thing that you were suggesting. Yes, also it was recommended that maybe you can get some more information for the classifier if you know that it's much more probable this tag than another. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. I, I'm I'm but kind of forgetting uh, lots of information. I, I could also memorize yes. how frequent those individual variants w would be. Yes. Uh, and more general question is whether you plan to use the context information. Actually, even in the uh, generation for check, you probably don't need it since all the information uh, needed yeah. uh, is yeah. encoded in the morphological tag. But you said that for German, some information which is needed <coughs> to go from lemma to the word form is not there. And I know, for example, for Russian, they have quite good morphology, mm -hmm. but for example, the aspect they decided that uh, both verbs, uh, I mean, both expect map to the same lemma, but this information is not encoded in the morphological mm -hmm. tag, so you must just guess it. And if you decide to guess it, probably the uh, context of the sentence would help you. So do you plan to include this into the Yeah, classifier? actually, I'm using few contextual features uh, for Spanish, Catalan, and German, and e even English, because uh, those uh, morphological taxets like some features. For example, in, in, in English, I use uh, the previous word lemma and previous word tag, because otherwise I couldn't uh, uh, distinguish between was and where in, in the past tense, because the, the tag doesn't capture this. So I use some, some features of the previous or, or the following word, for example, in Catalan, there's some phonetical change according to the next word in, in the articles. So there I'm using the first letter of, of the following word. I see. So there, there are a few features from, from the context included in, in this but system. But no global optimization is done? No, no okay. global well, optimization. Maybe it's not really needed. Well, I don't know. <laughs> maybe we, we could try this even. So maybe you could also try the same for the analysis. Yeah. Use the context information. Yeah, that's true. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I have a few questions about uh, your, the way you handle lemmas. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you mean those? Yeah, in, actually, in, uh, in both of these cases. So. This thing. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. Because in in that fix, my. Uh, experience was that uh, most uh, errors in uh, morphological analysis and generation were related to ambiguous lemmas. Mm -hmm. Usually it was some named entities, so uh, usually it was foreign words analyzed with some Czech words, or it was some Czech names analyzed with different words. And uh, It was actually most of the errors that I observed, and with your approach it seems that it would make it even worse. Uh, Why? <laughs> because uh, yeah, it, the the at, at least the fact that the word is or is not a named entity is relevant for uh, for the for the morphology, mm -hmm. at least from my point of view. So. Yeah, I'm quite aware that this is really relevant for some applications. For example, named entity recognition, uh, <coughs> or mm -hmm. maybe even in in depth fix or. Mm -hmm other applications, but here I wanted just to get the base form mm. and possibly transform this base form into another mm. case. Yeah, I understand, but well, let's imagine the case that uh, when you do the simplification you get some ambiguity in your training data, so uh, it would be maybe good to handle it somehow explicitly because you said that for check, for example, if you have the tag and the lemma, so then uh, it's uh, one to one uh, correspondence between the form and the dilemma and tag pair, but I think it does not hold if uh, you strip all this information from the lemma. Yeah, that's true. There mm -hmm. are some, some uh, cases mm -hmm. where this creates ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's it's true that sometimes it may get inflected wrongly because mm. Mm. Oh, mm. I don't distinguish the, mm. the 
So yeah, maybe Lemma if you topics, don't, yeah, that, that's that's you know, like, really good suggestion. I understand the suggestion. reasons why not to have it in the lemma, at least if you want to use this edit scripts, so it would make it bad, but maybe... Uh, well, it, it would it maybe the, make it unusable, yeah, it, yeah, it, but it, it wouldn't work. maybe put it into the tag as, as a yeah, maybe. feature, like, I, I or, don't know whether it's reasonable, it's just a suggestion. Or to somehow, dis yeah, di somehow mm. distinguish the, the text mm. for... I don't know foreign words mm, from mm. Czech words. Yeah, yeah that, that would be possible. A good yeah. way to go. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's just a suggestion. Thanks. And second one is uh, so in the analysis, you uh, there there is no like a model of lemmas. So you just look at the endings and whether the lemma that is generated is reasonable or not. That's not taken into account, right? Right. Yeah. So, so as, as you can see in, yeah. in the results, uh, the accuracy of lemmas mm. is uh, really mm. lower mm. than mm. than. So do you think it would be dictionary. possible to to model somehow the the lemmas themselves, like whether the lemma that comes out after the. the you mean like using a language model for yeah, lemma probably on characters? Like that. I don't or, know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I really don't know whether it's reasonable. I have no idea, but uh, <laughs> well, possibly it is. So I, I, if it's a verb, it's more, more likely to end on the T. Yeah, mm. but but th this property would be captured by by the uh -huh. suffix mm. model. But uh, yeah, it's true that some very uncommon letter combinations mm. could be mm. avoided mm. using mm. this approach. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't it's seen the output, so I don't know whether Yeah. Really okay, good. I can show it to you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. It's obviously good you left so much time for discussion. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was partly um, my <laughs> I know. Intention. <laughs> uh, so, a first question would be um, about this evaluation, since we have it up. Uh, yeah. Just a question about the evaluation of uh, tagging. So, does it include for the standard taggers? Does it include, you know, distinguish? Does it distinguish the same thing that you do, for instance, or does it actually try to capture Tatra one or Tatra two? No, no, no. Uh, those taggers were uh, well <coughs> trained on. Uh, 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 dictionaries that that were modified to yeah so, so <coughs> it was dictionary in your form basically yeah in my form yeah I thought so I just wanted to make it clear yeah uh, then one more thing about the first slide I think it was uh, when you say that you lowercase everything does it include words that are all capitals like USA or OSA OSA yeah I think it does maybe it could improve the results. It's just uh -huh. a guess. Yeah. If you don't try to, you know, lowercase the word osa, if it's written in all capitals, because not, then not it's a kind of a good yeah. guess that it's a shortcut for something, and you probably uh -huh. don't want to that's, that's uh, give it case endings. And so I'm on. not exactly sure. Maybe I, I do this in in the generation part, but not in the analysis part, hmm. as I think of it now. So. <laughs> Maybe I should fix this in, in the analysis. Okay. And actual question is for um, for your results when you compare um, the generation, and you mm -hmm. actually have better generation. If I understood correctly, your generation results for noun words are better than a dictionary lookup in Jan Heitch's uh, dictionary. And if you could explain that. Well. Uh, I think that uh, this depends on the coverage of, of Jan Heitch dictionary. So, uh, if if so, some some uh, base form is not in the dictionary, it just refuses to generate anything, and you use the base form. So this is probably so, the, the coverage of, of Jan Heitch dictionary. That's of, the ninety-two percent. No? Uh, no, 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 no. That's so, 98 percent. So that 92 percent is just memorizing the training data of, of PDT. I see. So the 98 percent includes unknown words. Yeah. Okay. I didn't understand it. I thought so. it's comparison on just known words. 
No, no, no. It's 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 yeah. also with unknown words. These are all all words from. Yeah. The so so the so the difference set. is that it has no logic for unknown words. So yeah. The results there are very bad, unlike yours for unknown words, which are actually pretty good. Yeah. Exactly. So for noun words, it's reasonable to estimate that the results of dictionary lookup are kind of hundred percent. Yeah, I would say so. Okay. They are probably better than my system because they Th don't suffer actually, from such errors as torpedo. There can still be some small variance if, if there are two forms possible. Yeah, that's true. But I thought that it's probably not, not such a big number. Yeah. Okay. So, thanks. So I suppose that the model trained on the PDT data still stays in uh, Creative Commons S A B Y uh, and C. I uh, don't know. I, I would say it doesn't because it is not a derivative of PDT 2.5. It's, it's something that's created using the the, the corpus. But, but that, that's the core of my question. So you don't feel it as a as a derivative work even if you do use the tags. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I I, I think that, uh, for example, if I use Microsoft Word to create a document, it, the document is not under the same license as Microsoft Word, and I can do whatever I want with that document. So I would kind of uh, apply the same logic here. And you feel that we could apply the same logic for the other uh, 29 free banks of, of, of Hamla? Yeah, I would say so. I don't know. Uh, I think that you could happily provide uh, models for parsing train on those three banks, and they wouldn't be bound by the same terms as, as the three banks itself, themselves. I'm not sure. I'm really not a law expert, but. <laughs> I think it is true as, as far as the data is not really included. I think that's kind of the vague distinction, at least in my mind, that if you create a derivative work in terms of the license, then it actually is the same work. So the words are there or the texts are in your data. But if you just compute some statistics from it or learn some statistical model and you only have that and not the, un so nothing of the underlying data except for some probabilities, is in your data, then it's then it's a different thing. At least that's how it commonly works. That, for instance, English parsers are available even though they are trained on Pentry Bank that is not, and nobody has a problem with it because everybody kind of assumes that if you only include the numbers, only the statistics, the probabilities from the data, but not the data itself in any form, then it's kind of far enough, I would say. It would be different if you extracted a dictionary from the from the data yeah, and, and distributed that. Well, but the dictionary is, is not the data. I mean, you, you don't have any connections well, be, between the words. Well, if you, yeah. So if you, I, I if you know, take it, the it, data and I would say if you extract a dictionary from data, it basically means that you take the data, transform it a little bit, and throw away a little bit. That would be a derivative work. Yeah, but in a way, that's the same you do with, with the parser. It's only that you transform it a bit more. Yes, and, and if you transform it enough, then more. it's not a derivative work. That's, that's so basically it's, what it's I think. So it's just the question of where, where the, the boundary is. Uh, different suffix lengths for other languages because for the um, Czech language you used three and four. I think I that I've tried. Uh, you mean in, in the generation part because uh, the analysis was only done on Czech. In the generation part, uh, I've tried. Uh, I think that I've tried four, six, and eight characters or suffixes up to the, this length to, to be used as features. And it didn't make much difference uh, to using just four characters. So such features are really very sparse. 
and the, this system is, isn't able to learn anything from them. So. Okay. So what's more, uh, thank you very much. You see, you have provoked uh, quite um, yeah. a lot of questions. Yeah, thank you and, very much, uh, everyone. And you <laughs> answers really to all of them, so that, that's fine. Um, as for our future program, uh, next week uh, there will be, if I am right, uh, more linguistically oriented talk, which is not to discourage you to come, uh, but to invite you to come. Magda Shevchikova will be the uh, presenter. And just for you to know the future, uh, if everything goes uh, as uh, planned or as is happening, I would say, say not that much as planned, but as is happening, uh, we won't have a seminar in two weeks. Uh, on the 25th, because there is some um, infrastructure meeting. Uh, and uh, But we will have a double uh, seminar, as I've announced to you. Uh, double in the sense that there won't be two people giving a talk, but one person, uh, namely Candice Seidner, and she will have a two talks, one which she uh, thinks might last three quarters of an hour, a more theoretical one, mostly oriented towards uh, robotics, and the other one, I mean natural language is robotics, and the other one which will be after that, and that will be a shorter talk, 30 minutes, uh, oriented towards a description, and she promised not too technical, uh, description of one software system, which as far as I guess or know, uh, is uh, mostly uh, cons uh, based on um, discourse uh, analysis or discourse description by Ken Designer, Barbara Gross and others. So, and that's it, because the week after we have a gap and the, the week after that, we are too close to Christmas to sit down and uh, discuss something at our seminar. Uh, but if there are volunteers, I would be very happy. So thank you again very much, and see you next week.